No price talk and no Lambos. This is not another crypto podcast. Welcome to Ignition. I'm your host, Gillian Godsell, and each week we will be looking at the problems solved by blockchain. I'll be going deep, deep with the people building the apps and communities which are changing the world around us. Hello and welcome to EOS Dublin, the Ignition podcast by me, Gillian Gossel. I have the great privilege of interviewing some really interesting people and today is no exception. With me in the hot seat is James McKenzie, who's the CEO of Tokenora. But James has a very interesting career. So before we talk about his blockchain and his EOS stuff, whatever, I want to go back to the beginning, well, not quite the beginning, but to ask you about, you have a career in the electronics industry and how did you come to be in Asia? You're from Portland, Oregon. So how did that all happen? Well, that's a great question. Uh, It's a very long, complicated answer, but I'll try to keep it somewhat short. Really, it was born out of some of the turbulence of the 1960s. Uh, When I went to college, I got drafted uh, by the uh, U.S. Army. And at that time, uh, the Vietnam War was cranking up. And so I was prime candidate once I graduated from college uh, to go into the military service. So what I did was something that's somewhat unique. I was reading a magazine in U.S. News and World Report and saw that they were actually looking for people with business degrees to do administrative work in the armed forces. So I decided, hey, well, why don't I just get it over with and volunteer and go in as an officer rather than an enlisted person? So I signed up and got in the Army. And the Army sent me to Korea. And then when I was in Korea, I started watching the evolution of the uh, Korean economy and what was going on in the Orient at the same time. Uh, the, so I took trips to Japan and, and went all over Korea looking for uh, business opportunities. One of my friends that I grew up with in Oregon had a father-in-law who had a large wholesale distribution company. And he pointed out to us that a lot of uh, new products were coming from the Orient, particularly measuring instruments. So during my leave uh, from the uh, Korea, I, I went over to Japan and started seeing firsthand the evolution of the Japanese economy. New cars and stuff that I had never seen, the Nissans, Toyotas, all these companies were now creating not just little putt-putt taxi cabs, but uh, first-class racing cars. I say, oh, my goodness. And so I started looking around Japan for various manufacturers of electronics items, which uh, primarily were measuring instruments at that time. So I met maybe, I don't know, three or four different companies, and they were all freaking out, the Japanese, that how could a guy 23 years old be traveling all over Japan and be uh, trying to run a business? This is very unusual in Japan because the businesses were run by older people, like most of them were in their 60s, 50, 60 years old. My friend and I started importing the instruments into the United States, and we created a distribution system. And evolving out of that, it came through several generations of companies that we started. Uh, And I eventually went out on my own, and I started importing just electronics and electrical stuff. And he started. Uh, just kept the uh, measuring instruments. So what we did um, was uh, work together, despite all that, because we're friends, to help each other uh, build our businesses. But my business was built on a very a peculiar, I'll uh, call it platform, based on need. So I started the company with virtually nothing. So with nothing... I created models which were designed to, if I'm going to survive, I need to make a profit every month. I need to create cash flow. Here are the basics of running a sound business enterprise. To this day, that's how I approach business. And also, he, the same way. He is 77 years old. I am pushing 77. And uh, we both run the businesses the same way, which is we need to make a profit every month. Unless 
you do that in our model. Now, there are other models that you can do. If you get large funding, then you can change your model, but we never had access to that kind of funding. And so that's the basic of the story. That's how I got started. And what happened is as I traveled Japan and the Orient, I started meeting all kinds of people, very interesting people. So my business turned into a social activity, not just business. That's unusual. And my best friends became Japanese and Korean people that I met in business and wow. some Chinese. But you were, so nice combination. More... you were a nice combination of the profit model, which is very important. You're not just doing it as a hobby, but you're also making friends. So you're actually mixing two things quite nicely together there. Yes. And that's very important. Uh, in one case, my son got involved, well, not in one case, in all cases. Later on, my son uh, got involved with a Japanese. And uh, those Japanese people have now died. Those guys that were my best friends now have died. So my son has carried on and he is friends with their, with their families year, years later. So this is gone over, we're talking about, we started this in 1969. Oh, wow. So we're talking about 50 years of transition and friendships created between Japan and the U.S. and Korea and China. So So tell me then, what is the difference? Like You you build a $100 million limited uh, public company you know, going from a startup to such a big, huge company, what were the, the, the challenges that you faced? Oh, Especially that's now. a great, another great question. Mm. People. Ah. My failures were caused by, and I had some failures, not following my own principles, but adapting to theirs, which were often misguided. I was trying to help them, but by doing so, I was maybe compromising some of my own business principles, which made me successful. And in one case, uh, I had people in the company uh, doing drugs and stuff. And um, I was a little too soft on that because they were doing it. It wasn't the drugs per se. It was creating a culture Mm. that was not up to the standard that I expect of people that work. Uh, for me, because I really believe I'm there to bless the people that are working for me, not necessarily the other way around. So they are, I would say, dissing my blessing. Yeah. <laughs> so they have the disbless. Uh, so you have to be very careful in who you hire yeah. and really think about how long is that person really going to be with you? You may be planning on them for many years and they're really only going to be there one year. If they're only there one year, then you've done a poor job of evaluating uh, what that relationship should be and how that uh, is going to help your company succeed. I like you said that before, blessing your your employees. You you give them a blessing rather than the other way around. That's a nice, that's a very nice way in this mad capitalist world where you, you seem to see bosses really sweating their employees. It's a nice reversal of of that approach. Well, I, I created a different business model. And uh, some people thought I was crazy, but this was the key to my success. What I did was I incentivized uh, the executives. Uh, This is when I started getting bigger, you know, say when I started getting to about 20, uh, 10 to 15 million in sales, not when you're doing like 1 million, uh, because there's not much to share when you're doing 1 million. So what I did was, I was probably fifth year into the company or so, the last one, which was called CUI. I set up a compensation uh, system wherein the executives and salespeople were incentivized and the rest of the people got a piece of the pie. And the piece of the pie was set up that every month I distributed 25% of the gross profit of the company into a pool for the administrative people, not the executives and the salesmen. I like, so, I like, yeah. And uh, people said, you're nuts. Uh, you're going to go broke. Uh, no, uh, because one of my objectives was to make millionaires out of every person that worked for me. That was an objective. And in doing that, what, what happened, most of the people stayed there as long as they could ever last. 
because as the company evolved, some of the people became somewhat obsolete. They couldn't adapt to the skill set that the business needed. And we had a process for them. We call it graduation. My idea is to grad- graduate someone from the company, or if, if you call it, some people would say firing or dismiss. No, we don't fire and dismiss people. What we do is help them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if a person cannot uh, adapt and he's been with the company for 10 years, what we try to do is help him succeed and get him the skills to go on to something else or adapt to something else. So that uh, graduation would normally entail an interview by me to determine what the person's needs were, not how to get rid of them. So what I would do is uh, we would choose a plan. And I would finance that plan. So I would give a, uh, if you, you needed to go to school for six months, I'll pay for that. If you need to this, that, and the other, I'll pay for that. You need six months severance pay or, and medical uh, to transition, I'll pay for that. You need some kind of bonus to do it, I'll pay for that. So as a result of that, the company has... Uh, received a very good reputation amongst people in the community because, uh, with that kind of program. That also included all benefits, dental and medical, and also retirement funds on top of that. Wow. So, you're, you're, you're very advanced. That That is like what you're talking about there is, you know, modern HR companies would espouse, they would say you should do that. But you, you, you're yes. way ahead of your time. Oh, yes, absolutely. Wow. Uh, I, and it is part of the philosophy. I could be that person working in the warehouse mm. with three kids working for $10 an hour or whatever. Not, it's not cutting it. So that means that person has to get two jobs. Well, is that right? Well, that normally would be, well, that's his problem. No, you're part of my family. So it's more like a family approach. And uh, you're contributing to a family. So mm-hmm. how do you deal with a uh, problem if within the family, if it's one of the uh, people, it's more like dealing like that rather than it's a employee versus employer situation. I am really um, gobsmacked to use the vernacular here in Ireland. Mm-hmm. That is a fantastic approach. And, and we know now, I was at a conference in Texas last year run by a HR company, and we know now all those touchy fees, and that yours actually is backed by real finance and real help and stuff, but all those touchy fee things you're talking about actually make a huge difference in the company. It's not just nice to have. It actually increases productivity, loyalty, you know, all those things like your your man in the warehouse that you spoke about, he probably worked, you know, 110 times for you rather than just the 50 times because he had the second job to go to. So what what you're talking about, it's actually been proven by science and big data more recently, but you were doing it instinctively. Wow. That's correct. Wow. I'm very (laughs) impressed. I've spoken to you several times, James, but I am actually very impressed now. Actually, can I come and work for you? <laughs> <laughs> we'll start a little cottage craft industry there. I, I think so. There's something there. I've got, I've got to figure out what it is. But anyway, back to the, the storyline. So Western Africa, this is a big jump. We've been to the army, uh, Vietnam, Korea, your huge company, your philosophy in and diversity, what you're doing in, in the company, which is amazing, the whole family. And, everything. and then Western Africa, what happened there? Well, I met, let's see, I met some people uh, where I was going to do a merger with another company. And this is an interesting story by itself. This was, uh, let's see, yeah, that was about 1980. I met a company uh, and a guy, I will not mention his name because he ended up in prison. <laughs> but but uh uh, he invited me to come over to his office. I think I met him through a chamber of commerce or something. So I went over to his office and he showed me some prototypes of three-dimensional uh, laser imagery. I'm standing there watching this. I'm saying, wow. Now, it, again, it's 1980. It's not 2010. And I had this light. It's not a vision, but I could see this. Uh, as a marquee, you walk into a theater and there's a three-dimensional, eight-foot-high laser projection, image projection of Darth Vader. <laughs> so you would walk right through Darth Vader into the uh, theater. This was practical. You could do that then. 
And so I just said, okay, I want to do this. And so I started working with this guy and, and uh, he was forming a public company. And he introduced me to securities dealers and various people. And through that, uh, that guy uh, actually embezzled some funds from another company and he ended up in jail. But in the aftermath of all that, I met some people from Norway and those uh, Norwegian uh, people were uh, interested in some projects. I helped, uh, they were the ones that were defrauded by this, this scientist guy. And out of that came a relationship in, uh, with a Norwegian people, the fishing people. And then they, inter- uh, they were interested in becoming a public company. So I set that up with one of my friends. And they brought in another guy who wanted to set up a public company that they knew who was going to start uh, working in the fishing industry with, with them. And that guy was from uh, America. And he was American black Muslim who had lived in Africa for. Uh, I think he lived in Ghana and a couple other countries over a couple period, a uh, couple years. Uh, he was a uh, ex basketball player from Iowa State University, wow. and um, he and his sister were uh, the two first blacks to be integrated in the school system in Texas. And uh, he had interesting stories, and I became friends with him, and we started. Uh, uh, looking into Africa, he said, he'd tell me, Jim, there's great opportunity in Africa. So he went over there and he came back and, uh, and I met another guy who was in a telecom business and, uh, which I told you a story about this guy before we started this, he was in Canada and they, and they came down and visited me and stuff, that guy. So we set up a satellite, uh, telecom communication system into Sierra Leone and distributing uh, cell phone time amongst some of the carriers. So uh, we start on doing that. Uh, he went around Africa and we signed up uh, 13 countries. So I formed a consortium of West African nations that were supposed to, with uh, a telecom ministers, which were supposed to come in. And then I was going to provide a, a very large amount of bandwidth into West Africa uh, through the connections I had with the satellite companies. Well, uh, he wasn't back two weeks and all of these uh, communications ministers defaulted on their word and, and asked for a presence that I, I was unwilling to give those to them <laughs> for that privilege, if you know what I mean. And so we were looking for other opportunities and one of them was uh, gold. And this is where gold comes in. Okay. I was going to make a, make a point here, though. Sure. Part of the reason why the previous thing fell apart was because it's the high risk, whether yeah, it's the government. Very high country, risk. You know, you, you, it's very hard to put your money in. So that's, I was going to plant that thought out there, the high risk, because there's opportunity, but there's huge risk. So you yeah, huge telecoms. political risk, too. Oh, yeah, massive, massive. So you move from telecoms to gold. Right. You, you see the opportunity there. So tell me a bit about right. that, and then we're going to talk about blockchain. But so right. you've got gold well, first of all. It was never my intention to be in gold mining. It was to be in gold trading. And uh, so he went over there and people told me that I could buy a discount uh, gold platform and import gold in the United States, buy it in Africa at you know, maybe 15, 20% below what the spot price of gold is. Then I could import it in the United States, cash the difference. I thought, well, it makes sense uh, if the premise is correct that you can actually buy discount gold. So I gave him an airplane ticket. He went over there for 10 days, two weeks, and proved that uh, all this is a bunch of yak and mostly fraud. So he came back, uh, and then he had met another guy while he was there. And that guy came and visited me on July 4th, 2009. He brought me the first uh, proposal of... uh, African gold mining properties in the Republic of Guinea. At that time, I said, well, this is interesting. And he, we did an economic proposal. I did the analysis, risk analysis, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I raised $1 million of my money and uh, friends' money. And we started a alluvial gold operation in Guinea. Well, 
I got the wrong engineers, the wrong person. That guy uh, really wasn't who he said he was. And he and one of his friends defrauded us out of a lot of money, and they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff, which they got caught. And um, but nevertheless, I what, even with those problems, I continued because I saw the possibilities there. Mm. So I've been continuing to develop the mining properties in West Africa. It was 10 years now. Oh. It'll be 10 years on uh, July 4th. And through that, uh, I could write a book on that just mm. alone. Not, I bet you can. <laughs> I mean, just every conceivable crazy. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> So then, so you have, you, 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 I mean, I said at the very beginning, you're very good at spotting opportunities, uh, you know, leveraging gaps and markets. And that. So you, you can see that there's definitely an opportunity here. So tell me, when you first met blockchain and Bitcoin, you didn't like it much, did you? No, mm. I did not. And I'm not that crazy about it still. <laughs> but you see its uses, perhaps. And I mean, originally yes. it was more speculative. It's a tool. Yeah. It's a tool. It's a tool. Mm. And uh, the the usefulness of it, and you were asking me a question before about when was this aha moment kind mm. of thing. The, the aha moment came in November of 2018. As some of my friends were doing blockchain investing and all that kind of stuff, and they had uh, made a lot of money and then they lost a lot of money. Well, there was... Um, I'll call a certain kinship there established because uh, that is the nature of the mining business. In the mining business, I I looked at the stock market. I have had some joint venture partners and still do have joint venture partners in the gold space. The number one problem in the gold space is not finding gold, is financing gold. Mm -hmm. The traditional models that are used in financing gold are set up for people that have large amounts of money. It's not for people that have small or medium amounts of money. So the public markets, as they exist, punish early adopters uh, that put the money in if they don't immediately hit it. So a small public company will raise a million dollars and they'll go out and drill holes in the ground and they'll keep improving uh, the nature of the deposit or proving out uh, what they have each time they go back into the market to raise money, usually the price of stock goes down. And it can often be with good results. Like a couple of them that I know, their stocks used to be 40 cents. And now they have really, and they didn't have any results. Now they're having good results or shares are three cents. Wow. So it, it's mm-hmm. uh, inverse. And so th- that's uh, a result of capital allocation problems and the competition for capital. So I'm sitting there, and this is a long answer to your question. So I thought about it and thought about it. There's a dislocation in the world of finance, in mining. And then it can be in other things, too, because the regulations are set up to restrict access to capital in an attempt to keep uh, people from being defrauded. And I mean, that's, that's what the government regulations are supposed to do. And so... But there's blocks that are placed there. It costs a lot of money to do that. The people that have the money, it's no problem for them. If you're a billion-dollar corporation, what's 400000 500000 or $2 million a year in accounting fees for SEC compliance? It's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. But for a small company that goes in and raises capital, uh, it's in, in the capital markets, established capital markets, it's a problem. So I, here comes blockchain. I'm saying, hmm, I like this because it, it's a form of democratization. It's splitting out. The, the capital raise can be on a worldwide basis, and it can come from small people. I don't have to worry about getting a large mining company to come in behind me to capitalize me, where in the end I'll end up with 5%, and they'll get 95%. So that was the whole idea Mm. after spending uh, from 2009 to 2019 struggling for capital. The blockchain opened my eyes uh, to the possibility that I could uh, have a good social message. I can have a good environmental message. 
and I can have a profitable business model, which are according to the principles that I ran on the other company, the other companies that I've been involved with uh, for the last 50 years. And the name of the company is? Tokenoro. And um, where is it at at the moment? Uh, right now, we are, this is the most exciting period is today. Because mm-hmm. every day, things get more interesting. So last time I talked to you, we were uh, working on uh, developing our uh, uh, projects in Africa. And then we had some primary targets in the United States. Uh, since then, I've had uh, two governments come to us that heard about what we're doing. And uh, one of them uh, is uh, in Nicaragua. I'm involved with uh, Nicaragua. And I'm also involved in Colombia and Peru. Those were not on the table when I talked to you before. Wow. That is exciting. Yeah, it is very exciting. And, uh, and the beauty of it is the models that we're trying to do are that they're trying to do the mining properties and areas that they're recommending that we do are they fit our profile, which is small mining, small miners, community support, education, health, and giving them a share of the pie. Oh my goodness. I'm really excited about that. I may have to emigrate. (laughs) (laughs) Well, catch this. On one of the mines, a small one, these small miners, and we're talking about mom and pop here and maybe two kids, are out digging up piles of dirt and hauling at two miles uh, to be processed at our processing plant. Well, that's an interesting idea. Uh, They get paid. uh, Now, this is a rural area of poverty, but but those people get paid about $70 per ton to give us dirt. $70, they could do, they could have a couple people uh, loading a ton of dirt isn't a very large amount of dirt, as you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Bring it and we, uh, we look at it and then we pay them $70. Uh, there's gold in there. Uh, it would be gold because we're looking to see if there's gold. And they haul uh, two loads a week. They got $140 a week in a poverty-stricken area, which there's no money. That's a lot of money. It's huge. So by doing that, uh, we're helping the community. And then we're doing a – this is the project I'm working on right now. It's not finalized, but I'm just using this as a prototype. Mm-hmm. I'm working on that. So I do have three different projects of that nature going on just since I met you last. So it's been very interesting to see. One of the mines that's near us, 10,000 people are doing the same thing. 10,000 people are doing this artisanal, small-scale pick and shovel and make a living doing it. But they'll make a better living doing it with us than with other large mining company who's there, which, whose name I will not mention. <laughs> so. wow. That is very exciting because you see a lot of those stories and you see kids, of course, too, as well, working in third world or developing yeah. countries. And it's just, you know, how do you pick yourself up? So these, these families, they'll be able to educate their kids and, and buy correct. houses and set up their own businesses because I'm sure they don't want to shovel dirt the whole time. You know, I mean, I'm sure right. there's other well, things. Well, then we can help them. We can help them. Uh, so what we're doing is setting up processing plant, and we bring in equipment, and we help them actually do more. Yeah. Wow, you're upscaling them. Yeah, yeah we want to upscale them. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. And so you're doing all this on the EOS blockchain with uh, Warbly. How are the guys yes. there? Yes. They're my uh, guiding light, so to speak. From what I know, and I'm not a, a blockchain expert, I'm using it as a tool for financing rather than I, I don't need to be a blockchain ans- expert. That's what Warbly is. Mm-hmm. They're the experts in the platforms that they have. And I, I like their approach to it to create a platform which will have multiple currencies that can be exchanged. And they're uh, and they've talked to me about uh, how to make sure that uh, $200 million doesn't disappear through hacking and stuff, through uh, creating uh, God keys and things of this nature, uh, which we can implement on their platform. So I'm wow. taking most of the guidance is theirs. And it's specifically, a tool. You know, but you're right. It's a tool. Like, some people get caught up on it all. You're no. a businessman. 
you've proven proven business track record. You have a fantastic philosophy in the way that you operate your businesses. I really admire that. And it's a tool. It's like buying it's a, a KCB or something like that, or you know, a shovel, whatever. Yes, a better- it's not a god with a small G. No, no, <laughs> it's so cool. No, I really admire that. So, will you go out and visit these these communities? Do you think, or is it? Is it Generally, I don't travel. Okay. It's a bit, it's a bit um, of a trip anyway. I'm just back yeah. in South Africa. It's a so, long way. <laughs> I, have, I have engineers and stuff that yeah. if I go out there, I know blah, 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 blah. This is more social, but I do know gold mining. I know a lot about it. Yeah. I've paid a high uh, entrance fee to be in mm-hmm. it personally. And, uh, but I have experts um, that can go out and live there and do it and love going there out in these areas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, working with the people and developing the properties. I have two of them right now. One of them called while we're talking here. Oh. Uh, and uh, what are we going to do about this, that, and the other, which is great. And, I, and I've told everyone, hey, don't bother me today. I have to talk to Julian. Julian, excuse me. <laughs> Thank uh, you I'm very much. Her already. <laughs> <laughs> so what, we've, we've talked quite a lot over the last little while. And I know, I mean, I'm going to ask the question, I know the answer. So like, What's in the future? I mean, like, do you ever stop learning? No, never. And uh, I, my opinion, uh, this is my opinion, when you stop learning, you're on your death knell. Mm. Uh, and that can be done, you know, uh, a disease or something like that. But as long as you're, you're vibrant and all that, I would think uh, that's one of the things that uh, brings life to you is, uh, and to your brain is continual challenges. Uh, we become complacent uh, with the things that we have. And as we were talking about before, you know, I, I count each breath that I have while I'm on this planet at this stage as precious. And I did not do that when I was 16 years old. <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Because youth, people when they're young don't realize that they're not immortal. They have no idea. But it takes a long while for that to come, that truth sort of to sit, sort of, you know, sink in a bit. Oh, okay, oh, okay. I might not go on forever. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but I, I do share your, your ethos, though, as well, the thankfulness. I think that is, it, it's also, it's a nice way to be, you know, and, yes. and the learning. It's, it's, just, it's a nice way to live because if you're constantly giving thanks, it means you must have something to give thanks for, which means, that's you, have, right. you know, it, there's a whole gratitude thing. It's a very, it's a nice way to live. It's, it's yeah, it's kind of cool. It's like some people go around saying, gratitude is the proper attitude. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I haven't heard that one. It's a new one. Well, listen, I've got to thank you for your time today on the EOS Dumb uh, Podcast Ignition. Uh, with me is James McKenzie, who is uh, a long-term serial entrepreneur based out there in uh, uh, Oregon. And uh, Tokenora is the name of the project, so and on the Warbly platform. So thank you very much for your time. Hey, thank you. 